Guess there's nothing I can do about it. And there's no point worrying about something you can't do anything to fix. There's no point worrying about things you can't fix. There's no point worrying about things you can't fix. Thinking too much is like thinking about nothing like water in the desert trying to make the plants grow. Your wisdom versus brain sprays on itchy scratchy stuff and when you should be filling it with sugar cookie dough. When you're feeling unhappy, don't think, don't think. When you're feeling kind of sad, don't think, don't think. Cause there's no point thinking about the things that you're thinking about, the things that you're thinking about are making thing and rough. And that's how Sana stays so happy. This was the first clip I've ever seen of Kadocha. It entranced me when I first watched it. What exactly about it made me love it so much? This little girl's infectious optimism? The cute visuals? The catchy song? Maybe it's the moral that it teaches that's actually practical and useful in everyday life. This clip is a vertical slice for all of Kadocha. It got me to watch it and I quickly realized Kadocha is the best shoujo anime ever made. To me, that statement isn't accurate enough. It's one of the best anime, hell, one of the best shows I've ever watched. Call me pretentious, but I love it. It's hilarious, it made me laugh out loud every episode, but it still handles serious topics in mature ways. Warnings for bullying, abuse, suicide, it also touches upon abandonment issues, trauma, divorce, oppressive parenting, and others. I bet I made a somewhat scary picture of Kadocha, but the fact it has serious adult themes or quote-unquote gets dark isn't the appeal. I just get so much pure dopamine from watching this wholesome, heartwarming show. I'm making this video to hopefully make Kadocha more known. It seriously deserves the attention. I'll be recapping the entire first season, but I'll interrupt every so often to insert my opinion. I uh, write this after I edited everything, and I go at a lightning fast pace to make this video decently short and dense, so I still re highly recommend watching Kadocha for yourself first. At the end, I will analyze Kadocha, what each character went through, what it's trying to say, and why I think it's a great show. With that out of the way, here is episode 1. We see the hyperactive 6th grader Sana Kurata get ready for school. Her mother, whose name is Misako, she's an award-winning novelist with a squirrel living on her head and doesn't let her leave without eating breakfast. Sana's 20-year-old boyfriend Pimp drives her to school. I think the first time this show made me laugh out loud is when his car drives so slow they get passed by pedestrians and Sana in the background keeps telling him to go faster because they're already late. He does get faster after being hugged and kissed by her, and gosh, the animation is so expressive. I kinda laugh so often that I think I'll just keep a counter on the corner of the screen. I really want to show how funny this show is and how much enjoyment I get out of it. By the way, if you think it's weird for an elementary school student to be going out with an adult, it gets resolved quite a while from now, so let's just wait until then. When she arrives in class, it's a riot and the timid teacher can't stop it. They say a student named Haima started it, and he's the boss for the other boys in class. When another teacher gets involved, Haima pulls out something from his jacket and the teachers become quiet. Later that day, here's where Sana's other life is introduced as a child actress. She's mad at Haima for being a tyrant and a delinquent, so she'll use the move she learned from her talent agency Kowamari to fight him, but hits this guy instead. They just have a casual conversation as Sana hit him and they don't even move, I love it. On her show, Child's Toy or Kodomo no Mocha, Zenjiro Sensei wishes to be a child again to which Sana retorts it ain't as good as he thinks. She's talking about Haima on TV and how much she hates him which he hears. After the eye catch in the middle of the episode, we see Sana wearing some different clothes. I know in real life everyone wears different clothes every day, but remember, this is anime, so I find it impressive they changed her clothes like that. I'll just mention this now, but she does wear different clothes every episode, so it feels like she actually has a real wardrobe, which is an amazing detail that they didn't even need to do. Mama, as Sana calls her, or Misako, says her outburst on Child's Toy might mean Haima will get back at her and she sings a song about it. She sings every episode and these moments are priceless. No words could describe them, so I'll play it in full and it's a good recap of what happened anyways. Here's Sana's first song of many.
これラブソングだったの Oh, and by the way, Ray doesn't sleep with her. He sleeps in a different room. This relationship, while kind of creepy at first, is at least seemingly one sided. At school, she says she's safe because of the move she learned at Kawamari, but just in case, she can still call Ray on the Barucha. The Barucha is a walkie talkie device where you can wirelessly vibrate the other unit. I love the Barucha so much. I think its usage is genius later on, but we'll get to it when we get to it. In this episode, though, it doesn't even get used because she accidentally gave it back to Ray right after being given it. She's just like, oh well, this is fun. Here you go. She gets found by the boys and they beat her up, but when Haima arrives, he tells them to leave her alone. In class, they shoot the teacher with colored ink, and as the teacher stops him, he pulls out the same thing he did last time, saying he exposed their true nature. Sana arrives and shoots Haima with the colored ink guns, practically declaring war against him. And that's all of episode one. I think it did a perfect introduction to the world of Sana Karata. And my favorite thing about the whole show is the high octane, fast paced comedy and gags that don't stop. I was sold in the first five minutes of the show, and now I can't stop, so that's a good transition to the next episode. After Sana's declaration, the girls gang up. Mommy here, the black haired one, even calls him a demon child. Sana calls him a monkey boss for ordering the boys around, but he just leaves. In the boys' bathroom, they plan to pay back at Sana, and Tsuyoshi, the glasses boy, is the only one who doesn't want to. They hear news that Mommy was getting bullied that afternoon, and Tsuyoshi privies them of their plans. But why does he care? Well, he said he. Likes Hayama, and Sana straight up calls him a homo as he desperately tries to prove he isn't one by confessing his love to Sana. We see the boys shove mommy into a pond, poke her with a broom, and make fun of her. Man, this is some serious bullying. I didn't expect a show like Kadocha from the second episode to be this harsh and evil with its bullying, but it does. Poor mommy. Sana saves mommy and is trembling with anger. She slaps Haima. In the gym storage room, Sana just wants to know why he's doing this, but he grabs her by the neck, strangling her. He just says he hates everyone, especially her, so she better not interfere with him ever again. She's not afraid of his threats, though. At home, Miss Sako suggests something about this Haima situation, and she makes a song out of it. I'll let you hear it. Next morning, she threatens him with toy animals and green foods. I just find the thought hilarious that she'd think Haima would just be scared of vegetables sitting under his desk. Haima, of course, is stone faced throughout all of this. She tries to extort his weakness through Tsuyoshi, but he laughs her off. In class, uh, oh god, the boys hold Sana down and then cut her skirt open. That is downright cruel. Luckily, she wore bloomers, and with Sana's personality, she's unfazed, but to anyone else, that would have been devastating. That's not enough, they lock her up on the rooftop. Tsuyoshi demands to have Haima let Sana go. This is going too far, but no one listens. By some kind of miracle, she gets some pants from the wind that has the Barucha in it and calls Rei. The whole car shakes as he's screaming earthquake. Damn, these Baruchas are powerful. Oh, and Ray runs over some elementary school students to get to her. They're late for work, but on the way home, she meets Yoshi, who's willing to let her on Haima's secret weakness. I like Yoshi's sense of justice, but ultimately, he's just a tool for Sana in this war between her and Haima. Once she knows her weakness, she pulls out a bungee rope, and we don't know what it means just yet. Next morning, she calls him out to the gym for a contest, and embarrassingly, when they do it, she wasn't prepared. So she calls Aya to pull on the rope. This is where they show the other female classmates, and I also love them. Aya here adorably acts for getting to do it earlier. It's really cute. So the game is to basically bungee jump, and whoever makes the least noise while jumping wins. Haima, who was revealed yesterday to have a fear of heights, should lose. Haima thinks this is all silly, but was pressured to do it. When he jumps, he makes the tiny littlest noise, so all Sana needs to do is just be silent. I just want to say in the background, Hayama's dancing is the best thing ever. 
So Sana jumps off, and well, I will let you hear the results yourself. Well, that was embarrassing. At home, since Misako Osana's mother is a writer, her editor is waiting for her manuscript, which she hasn't started yet at all. She says it in a real mean way, too. This is another gag. Yeah, I, I like it. At school, Haim pulls out the picture again as the teachers interrupt him and he runs away. He finally opens up to Sana that Haima is blackmailing the teachers. He took a picture of two teachers making out. At work, Zendro hears about these makeout pictures and is weirdly interested in seeing them. Ray suggests she take an embarrassing picture of Haima, just like he took an embarrassing picture of the teachers to make it fair. That night, Tsuyoshi, the only seemingly normal person in this show, thinks Sana is going too far, stalking him like this. This moment in episode 3 might be the first time it takes things seriously. In front of his house, they hear Haima's older sisters screaming, calling Haima a demon child and wishing he was never born at all, all the while kicking him out. Haima walks outside and smashes his fist against the glass lamp. His fist is bleeding. His father comes home and doesn't even greet him. Sana doesn't understand. Why do they act this way? Isn't that his father? Sana finally sees another side to Haima. He isn't a bully because he wants to. Bullies rarely do it because they're innate psychopaths who enjoy other people's pain. They do it because they're being hurt themselves. A great moral to teach children. But the mood completely shifts when Sana still follows him. He sends Tsuyoshi to pants him as Sana takes a picture of him in his underwear. This anime is absolutely insane for having such a comedic scene like this right after showing Haim's awful family situation. Kinda why I love it so much. Now that she's blackmailed Haima, she calls on the brucha, causing Ray to shove his rice ball into his face. Without even grudging Sana, um, he just picks her up and maniacally leaves, going along with her plan. Sana Mario backflips to give it to him, and they finally have an upper hand at Haima. And the episode ends. I'm so invested in this plot, maybe because it's kind of like a war between Haima and Sana at this point. It's interesting how they interact and what they'll do next. But in this episode, we finally see a vulnerable side to Haima. Tomorrow in class, Haima confesses he surprised his classmates and they let him boss them around. He tells the boys to concentrate on their studies and not follow him around anymore. Sana, now blackmailing Haima, has him around her little finger, forcing him to apologize to all the girls in class. They finally get to enjoy a normal class and the teacher's crying in joy. Of course, the next class it's pandemonium again when the boss monkey switched to Gomi, but his reign is quickly over after Haima punches him once. Though nowadays, he's transitioned from being a monkey boss to a lone wolf, becoming much lonelier. Sana realizes she can't stop thinking about him after slamming her face into the wooden vaulting box. That afternoon, going to his house, she meets with Haima's older sister who notices it's Sana from the hit show Child's Toy. Though when Haima appears, she scolds him for returning home before she arrives. She's willing to cook dinner for Sana, but not a scrap for Haima, and kicks him out of the house. Yeah, the older sister's kinda mean when she's introduced. Sana just says she's got work to do and leaves. At home, she ponders Haima's situation. He seems to always be alone at school and at home. While Sana's life is great with people who care about her. In class, Tsuyoshi accidentally calls the teacher his mother, which leads the boys to make fun of him, and he goes berserk mode, running around while carrying a desk. Haima karate chops his head, which knocks him unconscious and shouts, what's wrong with caring about their mother? Sana is wondering what Haima's family's situation is like, what made him say a statement like that to defend Tsuyoshi. Haim was treated like a villain when he was introduced, but now he's reduced to a sad, lonely husk after hearing his personal life. So now San is investigating that, I guess. 
Haim is still quiet in class and Sana bets he's still scared of her releasing that pantsed picture of him. Haima doesn't seem to care and asks if she's joining him to the bathroom, to which she shouts Baka over and over again as bystanders comment on her. Sana noticing he's lonely becomes a kind of counselor for him and follows him around. She just wants to see him happy and she'll do anything to help, so he says to kill him. He pulls out a knife so Sana could end his life. Now we see how Haima feels about his life at that moment. His family is abusive, he's alone at school, so he might as well not exist. Seeing Sana so happy about her life makes him even more miserable. Sana hearing this doesn't even know how to react or why Haima could think this way, so he's kind of a hopeless lost cause in her eyes. Running back home, she cries into her pillow at how stupid Haima is. The next morning, she makes breakfast by mixing cereal and milk, but by first crushing the cornflakes, then stirring it with milk, making cornflake paste. No one likes it, and that's hilarious. So at school, Sana imagines Haima um, wanting to end his own life and all yesterday, is scared he'll jump out the window, drown himself, and jump into traffic. I love how absurdly maniacal Haima is in Sana's hyperactive imagination. It's a great bit. Sana visits Haima's house and sees his older sister throwing and breaking plates, blaming Haima for burning the curry. She can't even focus on studying. If she can't get into a high school, it'll be Haima's fault. After all, he's the reason their mother is dead. She notices Sana and stops tantruming. Haima finally explains his situation. When he was born, his mother died in the birthing process. That's the reason why his family hates him, and it's what he had to deal with the past 11 years. She tells him that their mother gave all she had to birth him, so he shouldn't give up. She tells him to look forward to her drama that's pretty similar to Haim's current situation, and she'll work hard on it, so he should do the same. There was already emotional scenes before this, but this scene was the one where my eyes watered a bit, and the reason why is not only getting to know Haim's past, but also the music. It immediately becomes upbeat when Sana motivates him to keep living. Hey, while we're on the topic of music, the music is great. Hear this for a moment. That is the motif for many tracks on the OST. I believe the key to a memorable soundtrack is a motif. I won't remember every single track, but I'd most likely remember this little jingle if it's everywhere, you know? This melody plays in my head every so often. It's both uplifting and comforting. One more thing. Goodbye Love is such a good song. I'm weak to sappy love songs. Okay, continuing on. The older sister calls Sana from the window thanking her for the autograph, and Sana says she's a normal person. Uh, no, she's kind of a psychopath who will hide her emotions for other people. She's downright cruel these first few episodes, but later on she becomes okay, you'll see. Rain's in the car waiting for her. He's singing about how Sana forces him to wear sunglasses all the time, even when it's dark and he can't see a thing. Pretty dangerous to drive like that, but okay. Sana opens up to Ray about she being hesitant to accept being in the drama when it's so depressing, but it's exactly like Haima's situation and hope he'll enjoy life after watching it. Oh uh, gosh, I love this episode. It had so many funny moments, but made me kind of cry at Haima's reveal of his dark past. It's an emotional roller coaster. The mystery of Haima is over now, now that we know why his family hates him. The last episode of this first arc is focused on resolving those issues. Sana runs at 100 miles per hour to find Siyoshi and she asks about Haima. He really thought of himself as a demon his entire childhood, and it must have triggered something in him when mommy called him 
a demon child. On the recording of the drama, she meets Kurumi Asako, the famous actress playing her sister in the drama, but Rei is suspiciously hesitant in meeting her. I think it's best I show their drama scene in full. お姉ちゃん、お母さん体壊して入院してるのはあなたは無理して産んだせいだって。それから私はずっと働き通しよう。あんたの面倒を見ながら。私だって幸せになりたいのに。もうだってないよ。お兄子。あんたさん生まれてこなければ。ごめん
Not every episode is amazing anyway, so instead I'll talk in depth about highlighted episodes from the first season and gloss over the less impactful ones. Before that though, I think we should continue with the recap until episode 8 at least, so you'd know the aftermath of the first arc and where the series could continue after that, because this show isn't all just about Haima. So let's continue with episode 7. Sano is hoping to sleep in Rei's arms, telling her how great she is, but sadly he's gone. After the night they watched the drama, his father started to take care of him and even his sister made kanji for him. It's so hot, even his father keeps shaking the pot after she's gone. Well, that was the older sister's redemption arc, and you know, I kind of forgive her. The family started caring about each other, so that's good. Sana gave Ray his allowance in a million envelopes, and when he said he was sick last night, she put her forehead on Ray's, but now the car is out of control. Aima was able to watch last night's drama from the recording, and of course there's an obnoxious ad for toothpaste right after the serious scene, so he had to keep rewinding to not hear it. He sees Sana in a brand new light. Okay, the car just dives into the building and explodes. <laughs> Are these counter pings getting annoying? Blame the show. This show is a try not to laugh challenge for me. Asuko, the actress from yesterday's drama, invites her to an interview. In class, Sana gives Haima back his pantsed picture, so now nothing is holding him back. Siyoshi expresses some kind of affection for Sana, but she already has Rei, who calls her a pimp. I'm 19 as of watching Adocha, and I don't know what pimp meant. So I was surprised after searching what pimp meant on Google, Sana would call Rei her pimp. Oh, and Siyoshi explodes. I haven't mentioned this yet, but the headgear that Misako has changes every scene for the squirrel living on her head. It's so creative for a detail that's not important at all. It's implied that Rei doesn't want to go with Sana for her interview with Asako. It's clear that Rei is avoiding her for some reason. The scene where Rei feigns sickness and Sana is reacting to the news is a great example of how Kadocha isn't scared of using the medium of animation to its fullest. It's a cartoon, why not make anything happen on screen? When she ran to find an ambulance, she broke into the wall. She tries healing Rei with a shrine maiden outfit to ward the spirits away, and is sitting under a waterfall. Then, to show she let it get to her head, Sana and Mama's head explodes and their hair was frizzy for the rest of the scene. Not only is it expressive and creative, it's made funnier that the jokes stick for a while as if it actually happened. The comedy style is genius, and I want to find more anime like it. During the interview, Asuka asks about the rumors surrounding her manager, Rei. It's true he has a girlfriend and he is dating Sana. Well, that's what Sana says at least. He used to be a hermit and a scaggard after a nasty woman broke up with her, and this hurt Asako. Implying Asako broke up with Rei, but Sana's too oblivious to understand that. In fact, after she connected the dots that Rei didn't want to meet her and Asako is asking about Rei, she assumes wrongly and thinks Asako is actually going after Rei herself, so she sets off. Asako immediately tries to find Rei. She eventually corners him, saying she's been searching for him this whole time and that she didn't dump him. She takes his sunglasses off and Sana sees this happening. So that is episode 7. After Haima's arc, I get straight into Rei's arc with his past uncovered that he used to date the popular actress Asuko Kurumi, who might or might not have dumped him. It's clear Rei is trying to run away from her by pretending to be sick, so I wonder what's gonna happen now. Rei says Sana is the most important thing to him right now, and Asuka just says, Wow, you'll leave me then become a lolicon or something? While it's played for laughs, Rei's care for Sana is real and deep. But not in a romantic way, which that would be weird, just in a way an adult would care for a child, you know? Sana, in response to his sunglasses breaking, puts on silly glasses with eyes on them while doing a classic Koamari somersault. Even funnier, the media find out they're there, and... Sana proceeds to give everyone these silly glasses. As Asuka passionately shouts Rei's name for them to meet again someday, these glasses are still being worn. How many times can I say I love this show without being repetitive? In an intimate scene, Rei makes sure to let Sana know she's the most important thing to him right now. However, in class, Haima says the opposite. There's no way Rei cares for a 6th grader. That woman is who he's really after. Sana storms off, opening the door just by exhaling through her nose. She walks home by herself and Rei meets Yoshi and Haima who tell him she's avoiding him. In a restaurant with Yoshi and Haima, Rei explains his past. He used to be homeless until he met Sana who gave her bento to him. 
She didn't know what being homeless was, and when Misako explained it to her, she must have thought it'd be nice to be nice to them. She even let him live with her, and Misako, I guess, never objected. Okay. After that, he promised to give back to Sana. He is incredibly grateful to her. Hayama now knowing their relationship, he thinks Rei is playing Sana as a fool. He is just playing around, pretending to be her boyfriend. He storms out and asks Tsuyoshi if he likes Sana. He does. He says that makes them rivals. Now that's how you set up a love triangle. I've never mentioned this, but every so often a bat rabbit creature named Babbit interrupts as like a cute mascot for comedy, usually as a straight man, explains the relationship chart and Kodocha. It goes like this. <laughs> So at home, Rei approaches Sana, but she avoids him. This is the first time the Barucha gets used in a serious way. He calls her on the Barucha, so she stops and turns around. Sana just tells him she doesn't need him to drive Sana anymore since she'll use the train. The Barucha is a genius plot device because it binds these characters together even when their relationship becomes rocky. Later on, it actually has narrative meaning when someone is separated from their Barucha or something like that. If I ever get an electoral engineering degree, you bet I'm making a Barucha first thing. In his room, he calls Asuka to call him, but he doesn't know where to reach her. They had a school trip to the Shinjuku Observation Hall, and on the way there, Aya hints she likes a boy in class, and Sana advises to declare herself with a kiss or two. Sana kind of feels bad for making fun of Haima being scared of heights when they're currently pretty high up for their school trip, and gives him a drink, but she accidentally spills it on him. Haima thinks back on what Sana said earlier on their way here, and... Ray, on the ground, who knows Sana didn't want him to be there for her, still wanted to see Sana. But he's currently in the middle of chaos and traffic accidents in the city, wondering what happened. That's the end of episode 8, and that's all I'm going to be directly recapping for Kadocha. That's almost the fifth of the first season. Also, I bet you didn't expect Sana and Haima to kiss so early on. I definitely expected them to slowly get to know each other and show their love at the end of the first season, but... Damn, episode 8? Now that's subverting expectations. So for the rest of the episodes, I'm just going to talk about highlights, like the, that narrative themes of arcs and episodes more so than recaps, because that's just much more dense and interesting. And the other reason is I don't want to write, record, and edit a 4 hour long video. So here we go. We're currently in Ray's arc, and with his past with his ex-girlfriend actress. He's scared to meet her, but he's later forced to. Another thing they're dealing with is Sana, who claims Ray for herself thinking they are in true love. The show makes an interesting allegory. It introduces Ayuno, who is Tsuyoshi's little sister. She thinks the egg she bought from the supermarket can hatch a chick, and Sana keeps up with the lie. She doesn't need to know the true world yet because she's a child, but Haima criticizes her. She had to deal with the exact same thing, to live in the fantasy that Rei loves her. Ray doesn't love her romantically, but of course he still cares about her. Just not in the way that Sana is thinking, and that hurts her. The show presents the harsh moral that it's probably best to teach your children fantasies aren't real, earlier than later. It'll just hurt them harder later on. Episode 13. Tsuyoshi's parents are going through a divorce. Yikes. It's an awkward situation for a child, and through Tsuyoshi it presents his emotions about all of this. He of course still loves his father and mother, so it's unfortunate they don't want to be together anymore. The children live with their mother, but Tsuyoshi really wants to meet with his father again. They have to deal with moving to a different place, his name changed, and the little sister who doesn't understand the situation asks why is her father gone now. When Tsuyoshi meets his father again, they don't know what to say to each other. The point is, it's an awkward and difficult time for a child. Oh, and the best couple in the show appears, Aya confesses her love for Tsuyoshi. They are so cute together, I'm jealous of Tsuyoshi.
Episode 14 to 15, because of a promise, Misaka will write a book about her and Sana's lives, which will be released after her school trip. They know after releasing the book, you'll create a stir in the media and their happy life might end. During the trip, she puts on a happy facade and only Haima notices her true feelings. He promises to be there to comfort her whenever she's sad. It's a really touching moment and what with Sana being an actor, she's too good at hiding her emotions to everyone else. But only Haima noticed her sadness. She feels ease whenever Haima is around her. Two other things happen here. Naozumi, who's a popular child actor, Sana gets introduced to. And, and the teacher, Miss Ando, she's the strict teacher archetype whose makeup cracks whenever it's mentioned and her gag is limbo dancing. It's pretty dumb, but eh, kind of funny. Episode 16. There's a new rival for Sana's affection, Naozumi. This creates a conflict between him and Haima. Naozumi makes a good point. While he does acting, Haima doesn't have any lifelong goals. He isn't striving for anything, so why would Sana want him? He decides to take up karate after this. Going after a girl to motivate you works too, but anyhow, it's good advice. Everyone should figure out their lifelong goals. Episode 17 to 18. You remember that book Misaka released? Well, Sana's past is revealed to the media and it made the rounds. She was found abandoned on a park bench, found by Misako who took her in as her own. She made her into a child actress so that she'd be popular enough to attract the attention of her biological mother. Now that the book is written and released, they hope her real mother will contact them. There's a lot of risks. Maybe she isn't in the country, maybe she won't read it, maybe she isn't alive anymore, but they can't think of any other way. So miraculously, someone does call to confess that they are Sana's real mother. The show focuses on everyone's feelings about the situation. Sana is scared right now. She doesn't want to leave behind her happy life. Luckily, Haim is there to help her. Naozumi protects Sana by revealing his own past of being from the same orphanage Sana was in, but focuses all attention on him. And whenever a porter asks about Sana, he responds asking everyone to stop bothering her. He'll talk about himself as much as the reporters ask, so please stop bothering Sana. That was very, very nice of him. Misako and Sana's biological mother, Keiko, meet. The reason why she had to abandon Sana is because she was 14 when Sana was born and couldn't support her in any way. Even after Misako knows and relates to this, she slaps her. The role of a mother is to take care of their daughter. Abandoning her is frankly reckless and cruel. She lets her leave and what happens afterward up to Sana. Will she stay with her or be with Keiko? I love Misako. She's an ideal mother. Not just about taking care of their daughter no matter what, but also respecting Sana's decision instead of forcing anything upon her. After all, Sana was scared after finding her biological mother she'd have to live with her now. Episode 19. Episode 19 is quite possibly my favorite episode in the whole show. Sana meets her biological mother as well as their daughter, Maruko. The only thing she asked her biological mother was that she wanted to know what her real birthday was and doesn't ask anything else. Uh, she sure has some pretty wonky priorities. Mariko and Sana had a lot of fun playing together in the amusement park later on, but for Sana it felt wrong. Playing with her younger sister, it doesn't feel like they're family. It feels like she's playing with a young girl. So that afternoon, she gives her answer, whether she will live with her or stay with Masako. She bluntly says she doesn't feel the least bit of concern in her at all. But one thing scares her. ごく怖いです。だって、そしたら私今ここにいないんだもん。<笑> って思うと、そんなの寂しすぎるって思って。だから、あ、あれ？あの人が私を呼んでくれたことだけはとっても感謝しています。から、ありがとう。<笑> I 
can't imagine living life with the fact that I might have been up for abortion. It would have haunted me for the rest of my life that my life wouldn't have existed at all in the first place. It's so scary to think about. Besides that existential thought on your conscience, the real message here is to be grateful to be born in this world. It's scary she might not be here right now, that she might not have been in such a wonderful world, that she might not have met wonderful people who love her and she loves back. It's a very life-affirming message. Oh, and about Sana rejecting Keiko was also like pretty harsh and mean. After finally finding her abandoned child and wanting to repent for her sins, she rejects her. And the way Sana put it as well, she's not interested in her at all. If the show didn't have Keiko come back into the plot in future episodes, I would have thought Sana was selfish or morally wrong here for not wanting to associate with her biological mother anymore. But she does appear on rare occasions, so it's good the show didn't forget her like Sana wants to. Just so I don't get any misunderstanding, I still love Sana. Just in this moment, the harshness of her words hit me as well. When Sana comes back to her house in an intimate moment, she hugs Misako. She was worried about missing Sana too. ずっと不安だったのよ。いつか本当の母親が現れて、あんたを連れてっちゃうんじゃないかと思って。だから早くこっちから母親に会ってきっぱり示したかったのよ。サナは、サナは私の娘だって。ママも不安だったの。ママ、私ずっとここにいてもいいんでしょ？当たり前でしょ。エピソード 20。Episode 20 is a recap episode, and it doesn't recap everything that happened in the last 19 episodes, but it recaps most things. The way he presents the recap is in a quiz show where the characters answer trivia about their own show, it's pretty funny. Episode 21 to 22. It's revealed Sana and Aozumi have the same past and they visit their orphanage. She confesses she might quit being an actress. Well, that makes sense since all she wanted to do was to find her biological mother and they found her now. But she realizes she finds acting fun, so that ends that. Episode 23. So here is when Keiko comes back. She moved on from Sana, but Mariko, their daughter, is a big fan of her and wants to meet her again. She becomes missing as everyone tries to find her, including Sana. Zenjiro finds her, and I just want to say they're way too evil to Zenjiro this episode. He is usually the victim of jokes, constantly put in embarrassing costumes and made fun of, also desperately trying to find a girlfriend. Poor Zenjiro. Also, I love Aono and Mariko. Uh, don't add me. Sana and Mariko meet again, so that's pretty cool. At least they didn't leave on bad terms. Episode 25. So, Mommy was bullied by Haima in the first few episodes, and they're awkward around each other. Screw that. More like Mommy gets panic attacks around him. Sana wants for them to make up and be friends, but everything she tries, it doesn't work. She tries confronting Mommy directly, she pushes her away. When she tries making them spend time together, Haima feels bad about himself. Misako says Sana assumed only Mommy was hurt, but Haima also regretted his actions. <laughs> In the end, Haima showing true care and affection made Mami realize his true intentions. He doesn't want to hurt her anymore and is making up for his bullying in his own way. He takes care of Mami's rabbit. They don't become friends immediately, but now Mami knows Haima isn't a bad person. Episode 27. If you're wondering about Misako's love life, she married a useless man who keeps asking for money. Sana follows him around for an episode. It was okay. Since we're talking about Misako, her mother owns a bathhouse and wants her to take over the family business, but she refuses. We'll get into that later. Episode 31. Kurosaki is introduced here as a tabloid photographer who wants to fabricate the drama that Sana and Haima are going out. He does this. Ah! 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 Ah!
チャンスを逃せるか必ずスクープしてやるクラタスなはあまったく嫌なやつが現れたもんだな報道陣を It's a funny jump scare. It's a jump funny. He was a villain for a bit, but Sana meets his children. Sana realizes he's fabricating the drama, you know, his job for his children. Kurosaki loses interest in Sana, and it's all good, I guess. Episode 32. We get back to Siyoshi's family, and his father beat up a few teenagers on a bender. There's sort of a sin passed out in his family where they just get violent in blind anger. While Siyoshi has Haima to calm him down, his father doesn't have anyone. But Siyoshi realizes he's there to calm him down. He was confused on whether to visit his divorced father or not, but he steals his resolve to accompany him when he's released from the police. It was a good episode. Episode 35. Wow, another Tsuyoshi episode. I might secretly like him as a character more than I realize. So, in this episode, Aya and Tsuyoshi have been a couple for a while, but a new development. Tsuyoshi is getting love letters and presents in his locker from a mysterious sender. Now, Tsuyoshi has to choose between Ayana and this mysterious girl. Tsuyoshi has always been weak against gifts. Sana gave him a Valentine's chocolate and was crushing for her for a long time. His weakness to gifts affected him psychologically, so now whenever he gets a gift, he's mentally scarred. <laughs> The way Aya resolves it was really wholesome. She decides to constantly send Tsuyoshi gifts and cookies so that whenever he gets gifts from someone else, Aya will be there to give another gift to remind him of their relationship. Turns out the mysterious girl was some bullies catfishing him, and Haima beats them up. Episode 38. Haima didn't get much focus on the last couple episodes, but here, Sana and Haima's relationship progresses. Like, a lot. There's a whole love triangle going on with Naozumi and a kissing scene between them, and after that is a Christmas party where he gives her a special present. He spends time with his orphanage every Christmas Eve, and they sing a choir for her over the phone. Now, Haima didn't give her a present, but she respects the fact that it's indicative he must have thought about her present a lot to the point he didn't know what to give her. He realizes she'd be happy with anything Haima would give her, so he makes a little snowman. His other gift is. You might be thinking, didn't they kiss before? Well, there's a whole deal about consensual kissing. The first time they kissed, only Haima consented. This time, Sana didn't reject him. Was this her true first kiss? Episode 39. Right after that, there's a filler episode where everyone turns into moths. Wait, what? Before we get to the last 10 episodes, I want to discuss the last 20 episodes. After episode 19, I hate to say it, but the writing quality kind of drooped, in my opinion. I still love the characters and the comedy, but the plot definitely isn't as impactful as it became much more episodic, and that means it's kind of more formulaic. The setting for each plot does continue with something introduced in the last episodes, but the way the conflict resolves is usually from a misunderstanding or something equally underwhelming. Here's some examples. Episode 24, Haima still has blackmail on the teachers and uses it to stop additional cram lessons after school. Turns out the blackmail wasn't of the teachers he threatened, but of Miss Ando limboing. Yup, the thing she does all the time. I guess the blackmail worked because he bluffed, but it became meaningless after that. Episode 28, Haima's father is seen being around and spending time with some woman, and everyone thinks he is marrying again. Turns out it's just his wife's friend who he doesn't want to marry, but she is here to talk about their mother. Episode 
Two teachers, Miss Mitsuya and Mr. Tanaka, get into an argument about their wedding. They disagree about which wedding dress to use, either a wedding dress or a wedding gown. So the entire class is divided into boys and girls because of these teachers who now dislike each other. Turns out the wedding dress argument is void and doesn't matter because they just want what is best for each other. Episode 36, about Misako's mother and their bathhouse, it's being taken away by gangsters and Yakuza. If no one inherits their bathhouse, the family business will be given to them and Misako refuses to inherit it, so Sana is on the fence about inheriting it. But it all didn't matter when it's revealed those gangsters were just classmates with Nasako's mother, and him owning the bathhouse wasn't even that big of a deal. So, okay. Now, I'm not saying because of how these conflicts were resolved it means the episodes were bad. I love every episode. It just becomes a bit formulaic compared to the serialized episodes with a connecting narrative. There's still great stuff in them. The comedy is always funny. New information is revealed, like episode 28 with Haima's family's past, and sometimes the misunderstanding anime trope works, like in episode 33. It was cute how they just wanted the best for each other. During the boy versus girl classroom war, by the way, the Romeo and Juliet here was Aya and Tsuyoshi, which only made their relationship better and closer. As a conclusion, this episodic section from episode 20 to 40 continued concepts or plot threads introduced in the first 20 serialized episodes and gave more information about them, but the individual plot of the episodes themselves were lacking. The last 10 episodes became serialized again, or at least that's what it felt like. So, in my view, there's three big sections to Kadocha. The first 20 episodes with Haima's bullying, Rei's ex, Sana's past, and then the next 20 episodes that continue things introduced in the first 20 episodes. Each episode is standalone and don't relate to each other much. Then a big event happens that kicks off the plot again in the last 10 episodes. So, uh, hey, what is that big event that happens? Let's continue to the last 10 episodes. Episode 40 to 43. The Karata family is broke. All of their money is gone. The house, all the furniture, and everything in it is repossessed. Well, that sucks. Basically, Misako took a loan and wasn't able to pay it back. Since they're homeless, they sleep under a pipe at the playground. Later, they get an apartment. Even worse is that Sana can't get any work. Whenever Rei asks why Sana is rejected, they don't answer. It's part of a, some big scheme by a conglomerate to get Sana to sign with their company, but she refuses. In the middle of all that, Sana is writing her own book, just like Misako's book about their pasts. Sana is writing about her own experience from her own perspective. There's a cute scene with Masako where she describes the struggles of a writer and Sana goes through all of them. しめきり前の作家には77のミステリーって一体。まあ、見てなさい。ああ、こんなとこに早田が出てた。77の罠の第27番。何か懐かしいわ。の 1。ラーメン食べたい。あの時、早間って食べたあの特製ラーメン。あの、さなちゃん。第62番。どうしても食べたい。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ。ああ
I bet this is a controversial topic for an 11-year-old girl to be in a romantic relationship with a 41-year-old man, but in my honest opinion, I really got to like their relationship in the last few episodes. I can see and understand what they mean to each other. I still think Sana will be with Haima in the end, and I don't think she would actually be with Takashi, but it's a genuine mutually beneficial relationship, and Takashi doesn't have any ulterior motives, so I don't think it's a serious problem. As an example to how they improve each other is Sana was having trouble confronting her classmates for not writing about her in her book. Usually she'd be able to laugh it off and apologize the usual Sana way, but this time she's scared. She runs away to Takashi, who's in the mountains for a scene. She wants to be beside his side forever. Takashi has had experience running away from his problems before and tells her it's okay to run away. What's important is getting back up and fixing her problems after running away. She does just that. Can't believe Kadocha just fixed all of Shinji's problems. One more thing about Takashi and Sana, maybe because of Sana's reputation, she only accepted, like, small jobs and minor roles as extras? I was wondering why, because she had main roles before, but maybe she's just following whatever Takashi's jobs were. Episode 43 and 44. We'll get back to Takashi in a bit, but there's another person the last few episodes focus on. Gomi. He's one of the bad boys in Sana's class. He doesn't have the best grades, so his mom, who wants him in the best school, forces him to study more. This woman is a total helicopter mom. She's controlling and doesn't consider Gomi's actual feelings, and he can't do anything about it. She doesn't trust his school and hires a mentor to teach him at home. Out of all of the characters in Kadocha, I relate to Gomi the most. After public pram schools didn't increase my score, I was forced into personal study sessions with tutors at home and I hated every hour of it because I never wanted it. Gomi's story became even worse. In an emotional outburst, possibly to vent and rebel from his mother, he shoplifted multiple water guns but he ran into Haima and he got the blame instead. Gomi's mother heard the news and she said if Gomi was the one who did that, there'd be unspeakable unspeakable consequences. She'd probably disown him. I say unspeakable because the mother didn't say anything. It just kind of threatened that she would do something. Just to add to his shame, his friends made fun of Haima for shoplifting specifically water guns and called him pathetic and lame, but instead, Gomi felt that comment hit him. He eventually confessed after seeing Haima stick up for him, and also wanted to go to the same middle school as everyone else. Gomi's arc was great, and I related to him and gave necessary insight to his character. He used to be a big bully, but we see a vulnerable side to him. Now we see him being pushed around by his mom and these gangsters that I didn't mention at all, but they do also push him around. These gangsters, by the way, targeted Haima, and Gomi protected him from them. I, I love his turnaround of a character. Episode 45. Okay, back to Takashi. He plays the biggest part when it comes to the finale for season 1. You're gonna get into my second favorite episode, under episode 19. Takashi is absent for his scheduled scene and Sana leaves to find him. All while Rei tries to entertain everyone else and it actually kinda works. He's on an express train that doesn't stop at any station until its final destination. He's not planning to come back. He talks about his past to Sana. He had a girlfriend in Japan, but left for America. He thought he could improve his acting there. He has this fear inside of him. He just can't seem to commit or see something to the end. It deeply saddens him. He's always lived his life like this. もう<笑> I think it truly is a crime what he did, not just because he left his girlfriend, but I think I'll reveal it right now. He is Sana's father. He left Keiko behind for America. Keiko was 14 when she had Sana. That's pretty bad in and of itself. 
and then Keiko had to abandon Sana because she couldn't support her. It's not weird to assume a big part of why she can't support Sana is because Takashi left her. Poor Keiko, by the way, I truly believe she is the one who suffered the most in Kadocha. But that's kind of the point. His sins is what created Sana's past. He is truly a broken man. He lived his whole life like this and lives with regret. Luckily, Sana is such an optimistic girl that she doesn't even think about these things. Well, also because she doesn't know he is her father yet, so let's get into that. Kurosaki gets back into the plot. Remember the angry face jump scare man? Yeah, that's him. He used to fabricate the drama between Sana and Haima, but this time he finds the relationship between Takashi and Sana fishy. So he digs around and finds out she is actually Takashi's daughter. Misako learns of this as well and gets confirmation from Keiko. She bribes Kurosaki to not tell them their true relationship, but the situation became dire. Takashi has been suffering from a heart condition and isn't expected to live more than a month. So do they tell him this news before he dies? that he is Sana's father. After meeting with Takashi and hearing his sad story about leaving things unfinished, Kurosaki is saddened and angry at him. He will die soon. He should do more for his daughter. Kurosaki did a total 180. He became an actually helpful character and said things that other characters like Misako can't do. So after knowing he'll die soon and being Sana's father, he will put his all into his performance. In the final scene, they had to run and jump off into the distance, which was bad for his heart. He did it multiple times for multiple takes, and then the final scene came. ラストシーンだ。嘘でも嘘でもいいから娘を守り抜いてみたかった。できた。最後にやっとできた。最後に。たけちゃん。さな。お父。He did it. He was finally able to commit and see something to the end. To make this entire situation more tragic, they actually had a future now, and they already signed contracts for new, more popular shows. This is good because the show they're currently doing isn't a popular show and isn't taken seriously. So producers who hear of Takashi's death, he uh, literally died for this backwater show, they make fun of him for putting his all into this. Sana is infuriated at them. The next episode is focused purely on her bereavement. Episode 50. After losing Takashi, the symptoms of grief are at full force. A reduced appetite, a state of confusion and loss of hope, hallucinations, trouble thinking about anything but her loss. She keeps replaying clips of them being happy and acting together. She walks over to his apartment absentmindedly and almost... Thank God for Haima. This line, if I die too, I could see him. That hurts. That hurts to hear. Sana's willing to die just to meet with Takashi again. This leads up to Sana running back to the mountains, where she ran away before to be with Takashi. Sana's friends all go save her. They realize Haima is missing.
I've replayed this clip countless times. It's not just Aya repeatedly looking at his crotch, it's that she somehow didn't notice it wasn't Haima multiple times. Also, look at this guy's face. Sorry for giving you nightmares. Okay, back to the serious part. Um, Sana, she still has her hallucinations of Takashi, and even during an avalanche, she wants to stay there for him. But Haima appears to save her. She refuses to leave, but Haima persuades her to. It all comes around full circle. Just like how Sana taught him to live for the sake of his mother, she has to live on for the sake of Takashi. いっぱいいっぱい残してでも、ごめんね。ごめんね、竹ちゃん。私やっぱり、私やっぱり They go back to the village and they recognize Sana. She was on that show with Takashi. They loved their performance. Takashi truly did live a full life and made an impact before he died. <laughs> And episode 51 is a clip show, so that's the end of Kadocha. I really want to analyze and find its main connecting threads, but Kadocha is such a multi-layered work that comments on many things children and adults experience. Abuse, neglect, oppression, running away from your problems, misunderstandings, turning into moths, it has literally everything. Everyone has issues. The bubbliest, happiest girl in the world has to deal with whatever hardships life throws at her, and she breaks down, cries, and gives up sometimes. Kurata-sana was an abandoned child. She was abandoned by her 14-year-old mother, whose boyfriend abandoned her because of his internal behavioral issues. She is forced into the entertainment industry at a young age, and her manager was homeless and has a troubled past with his ex. Her actor and friend was abandoned at a young age too. She met a boy who's the class bully, but he gets bullied by his sister and neglected by his father. They're friends with another boy whose parents are divorced. Life kinda sucks, but Sana stays happy nonetheless. Her positive attitude is infectious. Once she inserts herself into their lives, they change for the better. And when she is in trouble, someone who she helped will be there for her. It's a positive feedback loop, and it all starts with Sana. Welcome to the post-video rambling section. Uh, I love Kadocha. I haven't read the manga or watched the second season or the season one dub. I'm kind of fasting myself of Sana content so I can have fresh experiences whenever I have a Kadocha craving. Hope you enjoyed the video. It was kind of messy because I jumped around the plot and heavily skimmed it too. I left out so many funny details, gags, and jokes. In the end, I just wanted to passionately gush about Kadocha and hopefully spread its existence around because it desperately needs attention. So what do you think about Kadocha? Do you agree with what I have to say about it? Comment down below your thoughts. Thank you for watching, consume everything, and goodbye. Remember to not think about things you can't fix.